imagination causes you and invites you to, to see life differently and to see what the possibilities might be like in life if we could imagine. And so two weeks ago, we started this series called I Can Only Imagine, based on excerpts from this movie. And we started two weeks ago in Mark chapter 2, if you recall, when we talked about imagining having the courage, the confidence, the creativity, and the commitment to bring our friends to Jesus the way four guys brought their one paralyzed friend to Jesus in Mark chapter 2. And then last week, still in Mark 2, we said, let's imagine what it would be like to see people through Jesus' eyes. Eyes of love and compassion and invitation and including people. Not, not through the eyes of Pharisees that are judgmental and critical, but through the eyes of Jesus that invite and include people into our lives. Like the way he invited Levi or Matthew to become a part of his family, to become a part of his life. When the Pharisees just saw tax collectors and sinners, Jesus saw people who needed to be loved who needed to be invited, and who needed to be included. Imagine seeing people through Jesus' eyes. Now, today, because we share so much in common with Jesus, more than the average Christian really realizes, we can relate to and identify with Jesus in many ways, such as Jesus said in the Gospels, that the things you've seen me do, you too will do. And we are doing them today. And in 1 Corinthians 15, where it says that as Jesus rose from the dead on the third day as the first fruits of the res resurrection, we too in Christ Jesus shall rise too. But today what I want you to imagine, because we already share so much in common with Jesus, more than what the average Christian realizes. Today I want you to imagine God is your heavenly Father. Because of something that happened, I mean, because it's Father's Day today, of course, but also because of something that happened in Jesus' life in Matthew chapter 3. So if you brought your Bibles with you this morning, could you take them and open them to Matthew chapter 3? And as you turned there, I want to catch you up to Matthew chapter 3. Because in Matthew chapters 1 and 2 is when Jesus was born. And then a few weeks after he was born, three magi from the east came and visited him. And then Joseph, Mary, and uh, Jesus all had to flee Bethlehem and get out of Israel, and they fleed to Egypt until King Herod had died because King Herod was looking to kill Jesus, little baby Jesus. And so they fleed into Egypt for a few years until King Herod had died, and then they came back to Israel and were told that they settled where Joseph was from, which was in Nazareth up in Galilee, which is the northern part of Israel. And so they settled there in Nazareth and in Galilee, and Jesus grew up there in, in, in Matthew's chapter 1 and 2, and then 30 years later, chapter 3 happens. So there was a little bit of time between chapters 2 and chapters 3 in the book of Matthew. And so where we pick it up now is 30 years later, Jesus is now 30 years old, and he's coming up upon John the Baptist who, were bapt who was baptizing people in the Jordan River. And I want you to pick it up with me at verses 13 to 17. It says, Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to be baptized by John. But John tried to deter him, saying, I need to be baptized by you. You don't need to come and be baptized by me. But Jesus replied, he said, it's proper for us to do this to fulfill all righteousness. Then John baptized him. Now, as Jesus was baptized and came up out of the water, at that moment, heaven was open. And the Spirit of God descended upon him like a dove, and a voice from heaven said, This is my Son, in whom I love and am well pleased. This is my Son, whom I love and am well pleased. I would like you to imagine this morning that God is your heavenly Father. It's easy to if you try, especially because when Jesus taught us to pray in Matthew chapter 6, just a few chapters later, Jesus said, when you pray, say, our Father who art in heaven. Did you realize 
that part of Jesus sharing in our sufferings means we get to share in his glory, which means we get to share his relationship with God, our Father in heaven, which means we have a fatherly, parent-child, paternal relationship with Almighty God. He is our Father. And if that wasn't enough for you, it says in Romans chapter 8, verse 15, that by his Holy Spirit who's already in us, we get to call him Abba Father or Papa or Daddy, which is if you're Jewish, you call him Papa. And if you're a Gentile like we are, you call him Daddy, which is a very intimate, informal, personal way of referring to God. It always reminds me of a friend I had once who always had to call his father, Father. I always called my dad, Dad. When we were real little, called him Daddy. And and my friend said to me one time, you know, I love my father and everything, but where I have a father, you have a dad. And I always look back on that and I go, maybe I had a more personal, more intimate, more informal relationship with my dad than than I appreciated back then. And it was through the eyes of a friend that I saw the value of of being able to be informal and personal and intimate with my dad. It's the exact same intention here in Romans 8, verse 15. When we call out to God our Father, we have the right and the ability to call him Daddy, to be personal, to be informal, to be intimate with him. And if that weren't enough, enough, God himself said in 2 Corinthians chapter 6 that I will be a father to you and you shall be my sons and my daughters. And in 1 John chapter 4 it says flat out, we are God's children. So imagine as Christians, God, almighty God in heaven is our heavenly father. We aren't just his servants, we are his sons, and we are his daughters. We are related to God. You are related to God by blood, by birth, and by adoption of his Holy Spirit and of the Lord Jesus Christ, which means God loves you, which means God wants you, which means God chose you. I mean, I think it's wonderful to have have children by birth. All three of our kids are children by birth and by blood. Our chemistry, our chromosomes are in them, and I love that and everything, but I think there's a special place for adopted children because adopted children, it says those parents said, I choose you, and I choose you. It's wonderful. It's personal. It's intimate to be related by blood and by birth. But let's not forget how special it also is to be related by adoption. That's choice. And we are told in the Gospels and in the New Testament that we are related to God by the blood of Jesus Christ, by the new birth of his Holy Spirit, and by the spirit of adoption that we get from his Holy Spirit that says, God says, I choose you, I want you, and I love you. I'm your father, and you're my son's and my daughters. Imagine how much I love you. That's the second thing I want you to imagine this morning. Now that we've said God is our Heavenly Father, I want you to imagine on this Father's Day morning how loving and how in love God is with you. How much God loves you. You say, Pastor, really? Yeah. I mean, check, let's break this down for a minute. Scripture tells us that he knit you together in your mother's womb. Now, I know about the biology and the chemistry and all of that sort of thing, but he's the God who put all of that together and then put it all in motion. So he knit you together in your mother's womb. So that means what? He essentially created you because he wanted you. And then we know from the Gospels he died to save you and he put your holy, his Holy Spirit within you. Why does he do this? Because he loves you. He puts the essence of himself within you. After he died to save you and forgave you of your sins, why? Because he loved you. You were created to be loved by God, who is our heavenly Father. And it says in 1 John chapter 4, verse 10, flat out, that God loves us. How much more plain can it be than that? That God, our Heavenly Father, loves us. So frankly, we just take Him at His word and we trust Him with our lives that on this Father's Day, we don't just celebrate the love of an earthly father, we celebrate the love of our Heavenly Father. Amen? 
Can you give God some praise this morning for that? And he hears me every time I call. Every time you call, your heavenly Father hears you. Now, I know it doesn't always feel that way, but it is that way because those are the facts of our faith. Every time we call out to God, our Heavenly Father, God says, I'm listening to you. And you go, how can that happen? Because there's billions of people calling out all over the time. God's got really big ears. He hears everybody all at the same time. Did you notice, by the way, going back to where we were in, in Matthew chapter 3, did you notice how God identified with Jesus? Notice how he said, this is my son. This is my son. There, there's got to be something special there about a son hearing his dad say, oh, that's my son over there. That, that's my, out of the whole crowd, that's my son right there. There's got to be something special about that. I mean, honestly, even in an elementary juvenile sort of a way, I believe that 30-year-old Jesus, that meant something special to him at his water baptism. When he heard God, the heavenly Father, of all things, creator of all things seen and unseen, when he heard this voice thunder from heaven, this is my son. With everything Jesus was going to go through over the next three and a half years, that alone had to buoy him up and give him confidence and give him courage and give him a sense of belonging, knowing he's not doing life alone. He's not going to do these next three and a half years alone. He's going to do it with God. God is going to be on his side. He is the son of God and God is his father. And he hears his dad say, you're never alone. What affects you affects me. When Jesus was on the cross dying in humanity, God was feeling that with him. God was there with him. God did not turn a blind eye to that. God did not abandon his son. The heavenly father was with his son. Because the Heavenly Father identifies with His Son. Now, can you imagine how God our Father identifies with you too? And everything you're going through. And it's easy if you, if you try, if you remember and if you realize that His Holy Spirit is within you. Which means He's not distant from you. Can you hear Him say this morning, pointing you out in the crowd, That's my son. That's my daughter. I identify with them. What affects you affects me too. When you rejoice, I rejoice. And when you cry, I cry. You say, Pastor, really? Come on, you're talking God. How is God affected by our humanity and his deity? Because he's our loving heavenly father, and I can prove he's affected by our humanity. He identifies with us in our humanity. Two ways. One, Jesus is God incarnate. God himself came in human flesh to identify with our humanity so that we could identify with his deity. And number two, I could take you to John chapter 11, verse 35, a place that totally blows me away in Scripture. God incarnate comes walking in four days after Lazarus had died, another one of his cousins. And four days after Lazarus died, Jesus, God himself, comes walking in and Mary and Martha and everybody around them are crying because Lazarus had died. They're mourning. He walks in on a funeral. And it says the two most important words almost in the entire Bible. You got to hear God identifying with the mournfulness of our humanity at our lowest points when it says Jesus cried. Now, I do not subscribe to those who say he cried um, because of the lack of faith of people around him. That would make God incredibly callous and cold. I believe Jesus walked up, saw everybody crying, people whom he loved, and God Almighty was crying in our humanity with us because of the pain that Mary and Martha were feeling. Is your God not big enough that he can't mourn when you mourn with you? Is your God so unfeeling and uncompassionate that when he sees each tear that falls, he's unaffected by it? You need to know that your heavenly Father identifies with you, 
identifies with your humanity. When things are going right, he rejoices with you. And when things are going wrong at work or at school or wherever, he comes to where you are. He comforts you. He sympathizes. He empathizes. He encourages you. And he corrects the problem. Because Jesus not only walked up and mourned with those who were mourning, he said, Lazarus, come forth. He said, I'm going to give you back life. Jesus used the moment to show people, I can empathize and sympathize with you right where you are, and I can lead you to new life in me by using Lazarus as an example. It's an amazing moment, John 11, 35, where it says, Jesus wept. Imagine how he identifies with you. He's your good, good father. That's who he is, and you are loved by him. I remember my dad would empathize and sympathize, would comfort and would counsel, would console, then would encourage and say, okay, now it's time to get back up off your, off your, back up on your, your feet. Okay, you got, you got your knees skinned. Okay, that's fine. Let's heal them up, and now it's time to learn how to ride that bike again. It's time to get up and never give up. That's kind of dad my dad was, very loving guy very encouraging guy. I believe our Heavenly Father is like that and even more. He's like, I see your skin knees, but now it's time to get up and never give up, never give up. You can do it because I believe in you. Why? Because you're my son. You're my daughter. And I'm never giving up on you, God says. And I'm going to help fix the problems that are going on in your life. I, I thank God that we're never Never, ever alone, because he's our good, good father, and he identifies with us. Now, fourth and finally, did you notice how God approved of Jesus? He was pleased with Jesus. He was proud of Jesus when he said, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. Now, now in Greek, it's the Greek word eudokasha, eudokasha. That's as close as I'm going to get in the Greek. It means absolute, complete, overjoyed, proud of someone. So can you imagine the way God said this? This is my son whom I love, and I I am completely, absolutely, overjoyed, off the moon, proud of my son, pleased with my son. Can you imagine how good it felt? For Jesus to hear his heavenly father say, how proud I am of my son. How pleased I am by my son. Jesus didn't have to earn God's approval. Jesus already had God's approval. And he knew he had God's approval. Now let me ask you, can you imagine God being that proud of you too? It's easy if you try. Because Jesus taught us to pray, God our father. Because God said, I'm a father to you, you're my sons, and you're my daughters too. Can you imagine how proud and pleased God is of you? Do you realize there is nothing you can do or nothing you need to do to make God any more proud of you? To make God love you any more than he already does? You know, sometimes I I, I think it's hard. I've known kids in my life growing up where you could tell their fathers were kind of expecting them to earn their favor. They're like, oh, I love him, but if he wants me proud of him, he's got to earn it. And I always saw that in, in sports especially. You could tell the dads who, who were just pleased and proud of their kids from the dads who were like, well, he can do better. Well, he can do better. Well, and you could see it in the kids' eyes. You could see how the kids were the strain of trying to have to earn their, their father's love their father's trust, their their father's proudness. Jesus never had to do that with God, our Heavenly Father, and we never have to do that either. I mean, for Pete's sakes, we're imperfect. He's perfect. perfect, Perfection knows imperfection can never be as perfect as perfect is, so God does not expect you to be perfect. God expects us to make mistakes. God expects us to learn. God expects to help us. God expects to help us get up and get on with life. And God is already proud of you. God is already pleased by you. Because God is already our Heavenly Father who loves you. You know, 
Sometimes we get down on ourselves, but God never does. In the applause of heaven, Max Lucado says, there is a boldness and a confidence and a courage that comes with hearing the applause of heaven in our lives. I liken that to Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. You've heard me refer to it uh, from time to time before as the bleacher section in heaven where it talks about that great cloud of witnesses that's cheering us on to victory up in heaven, right? You comfort and, I comfort and console everybody who's ever lost a loved one who died in Christ who's now in heaven saying, you can't see them, but don't worry. Somehow they can still see you because of what Hebrews 12, 1 and 2 says, and they are cheering you on to victory. Well, who do you think's leading that praise party up in heaven? Who do you think's leading the praise party cheering each one of us, cheering you on to victory? It's God, our heavenly Father. He's saying, come on, you can do it. You're my son. You're my daughter. Come on, heaven, let's cheer John on. Come on, heaven, let's cheer Calvin on. Come on, heaven, let's cheer Karen on. Come on, heaven, let's cheer Mark on. Come on, heaven, let's cheer John on. Come on, heaven, let's cheer Marianne on. Let's cheer Jeff. Let's cheer John. Let's cheer Mike. Let's cheer Jan. I can't go through all of you, but you know, got the picture. Let's cheer them on to heaven. Can you hear heaven cheering you on today? You say, Pastor, really? Yeah. Why do you think I keep bringing you back to Scripture? Because it's all true. God is cheering you on today because He is your heavenly Father. You don't have to imagine it because you already have it. God already is your heavenly Father. He already loves you. You don't have to imagine that he identifies with you because he does identify with you and you don't have to imagine that he's pleased and proud of you because he is pleased and proud of you. You don't have to imagine that which we already have. You just have to live in that reality, church. On this Father's Day, our Heavenly Father celebrates you and loves you. So you don't have to imagine what you already have, but I, I would like you to imagine this today as we close this morning. I would like you to imagine emulating God's love in your children's lives and in your grandkids' lives more than you already do. I would like you to imagine. Why do I want you to imagine doing more than you're already doing? Because imagination is the power that unlocks new ideas and new possibilities. Imagine how you can love your children more, how you can identify with them more, how you can be proud of them even more than you already are and imagine that they know this and that they hear it and that they feel it and, and that they, they, they know it in their being. Imagine your sons and daughters, grandsons and granddaughters, hearing, seeing, and feeling how proud dad and grandpa is of them, how interested and involved in their lives you are. Do something with your kids today and every day for the rest of your lives that conveys the way God loves you.